another roadside attraction. Copyright 1971 by Thomas E. Robbins. The characters in this book are fictitious and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This book is dedicated to the Kendrick boys, Captain John, deceased, and Billy, kicking, to Shazam, to Tiny Terry, and to the, quote, fantastic fully bear, end quote, wherever she may be. From John, chapter 21, verse 25, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. A quote from Lowell Thomas Jr. from Out of This World, a appendix titled, What to Take When You Go to Tibet. Incidentally, Reggie Fox, who runs the Dalai Lama's 16 millimeter projector, said that 16 millimeter Tarzan films or Marx Brothers films would make a big hit with the Dalai Lama and those around him. They most certainly don't want to see any pictures where human or animal life is taken. Amusement and adventure are things that they are interested in. Part one. The magician's underwear has just been found in a cardboard suitcase floating in a stagnant pond on the outskirts of Miami. However significant that discovery may be, and there is the possibility that it could alter the destiny of each and every one of us, it is not the incident with which to begin this report. In the suitcase with the mystic unmentionables, were pages and fragments torn from a journal which John Paul Ziller had kept on one of his trips through Africa. Or was it India? The bowl of white figs. His skin is very golden, and I try it on for size. It doesn't keep out mosquitoes, nor stars. The rodent of ecstasy sings by my bedside, and it goes on. In the morning, there are signs of magic everywhere, some archaeologists from the British Museum discover a curse. The natives are restless. A maiden in a nearby village has been carried off by a rhinoceros. Unpopular pygmies gnaw at the foot of the enigma. That was the beginning of the journal, but not the beginning of this report. Neither the FBI nor the CIA will positively identify the contents of the suitcase as the property of John Paul Ziller. But their reluctance to specify is neither bureaucratic formality or a tactical deceit. Who else but Ziller, for God's sakes, wore jockey shorts made from the skin of tree frogs? At any rate, let us not loiter in the arena of hot events, despite the agents of crisis who dictate the drafting of this report, despite the spiraling zeitgeist that underscores its urgency, despite the worldwide moral structure that may hang in the balance, despite that, the writer of this document is no journalist, nor is he a scholar. And while he is quite aware of the potential historical importance of his words, Still, he is not likely to allow objectivity to nudge him off the pillar of his own perspective. And his perspective has its central focus, the enormity of public events notwithstanding. The girl, the girl, Amanda. There are three things that I like, Amanda exclaimed upon awakening from her first long trance. These are the butterfly, the cactus, and the infinite goof. Later she amended the list to include mushrooms and motorcycles. While strolling through her cactus gardens one warmish June morning, Amanda came upon an old Navajo man painting pictures in the sand. What is the function of the artist? 
Amanda demanded of the talented trespasser. The function of the artist, the Navajo answered, is to provide what life does not. Amanda became pregnant during a fierce thunderstorm. Was it the lightning or the lover? She was sometimes heard to muse. When her son was born with electrical eyes, people no longer thought her foolish. Wearing a yellow velvet toga, gathered at the waist with green scarabs, a garland of blue Japanese iris about her neck, her bubbling baby strapped to her back, Amanda would charge her motorcycle through the meadows searching for rare moths. One lingering afternoon in spring, she chanced upon a small band of gypsies camped beneath a willow tree. Suspecting them to be skilled in such arts, Amanda asks, will you not reveal to me something of the nature of my true being? What will you do for us in return? The gypsies asked. Amanda lowered her long ashes and smiled sweetly. I will suck you off, she said. It was agreed. After she had thoroughly pleased the four men and two girls, the gypsies told Amanda, you are by nature a very curious woman, and sent her on her way. For her birthday, Amanda's father, who was enormously fat, gave her a performing bear. The bear understood only Russian, while Amanda spoke only English and Romani. Although she was very familiar with several of the North American Indian dialects. She never spoke them publicly. There could be no performance. What to do? Amanda made friends with the bear. She baked for him delicious meat loaves. She scratched his ears and fed him oranges, Oreo cream sandwiches, and Dr. Pepper. Gradually, the bear began to do tricks on his own accord. He danced when Amanda played the concertina. He rode her silver bicycle. He balanced three croquet balls on his nose and smoked fine cigars. One day, a man from the Moscow Circus visited the city near Amanda's town. At the request of her father, he came to see the bear. He barked commands at the bear in Russian, but the bear paid no heed and eventually rolled over on his rug and went to sleep. That damn bear never would take orders, the circus man complained. Frankly, that's why we sold him. That summer, Amanda's big project was the establishment of a butterfly conservatory. Since many moths have a very short lifespan, there was a big turnover among the inhabitants of her institution. Down by the waterfall, Amanda pitched her tent. It was made of willow sticks and the wool of black goats. Having filled the tent with her largest and softest paisley cushions, Amanda stripped down her beads and panties and fell into a trance. I shall determine how to prolong the lives of butterflies, she had previously announced. However, an hour later when she awoke, she smiled mysteriously. The lifespan of the butterfly is precisely the right length, she said. It was one of those mellow October days that seemed concocted from a mixture of sage, polished brass, and peach brandy. Amanda's father hiked, puffing, through the fallen leaves, nut burrs, and squirrel tracks all the way to Bow Wow Mountain. There he found his daughter in the mouth of a bat cave, talking softly with the idiot. The father was both relieved and perplexed. You have a terrible cold, Amanda, he scolded. I thought you had gone into town to see Dr. Champion, but someone said they'd seen your motorcycle zoom into the forest. I came to visit Baba, Amanda answered. He has revealed to me the hidden meanings of my fever and the deeper significances of my sneezes. When one is ill, it is much more logical to see a physician, her father insisted. Amanda bestowed loving smiles upon her father and silently continued to embroider her dragon cloak. Blushing, the idiot rose to his feet. He removed with respect his battered gray tam and stared down at his boots. Logic only gives man what he needs, he stammered. Magic gives him what he wants.
One morning after a wild electrical storm, Amanda woke to find a strange inscription on the palm of her hand, a single word written in some obscure alphabet. All during her yoga exercises, during her garden pagoda breakfast of poached salmon, strawberries, and cream, during her astrological plottings down the creek bank, she puzzled over it. She considered it as she and her baby rolled and giggled in the yard grass. She pondered it during her lunch of frog legs and coconut milk. Even that afternoon, as she circled the lake in her orange and purple sailboat, a choir of eight peyote buttons singing in her head, she probed its enigma. Though in truth, the inscription seemed less mysterious than funny to her then. The following day, the inscription would not wash off. She researched it in the Library of Anthropological Yearnings. To no avail, she sent photographs of it to young Jewish scholars who had loved her. She tried 12 times to decipher it during the trance. Pleading letters she wrote to the Ministry of Esoteric Knowledge, Division of Archaic Titillations. She never did learn what it meant, although one night, years later, in an Armenian restaurant, a very old musician took one glance at it, handed Amanda a heavy iron key, and ran down the fire escape. And what do you believe in the parish priest, asked Amanda sternly. Amanda looked up from the beetle shell upon which she was painting a miniature scene in watercolors. I believe in birth, copulation and death, she answered. Although copulation embodies the other two and death is only a form of mourning. At any rate, I was born 19 years ago. Someday I shall die. Today I think I'll copulate. And indeed she did. Birth, copulation, and death, fine. In truth, however, there are at least two other things in which Amanda strongly believed, namely magic and freedom. Only a belief in magic could explain the nature of her tattoos. And had she not been a very free woman, she never would have consented in the first place to being tattooed in that manner and in that area of her anatomy. Although there are more than 150,000 species of butterflies and moths in the world, only about 12,000 are found in the United States. That is far too few. Down by the creek, Amanda was speaking gravely to an audience composed of Madame Lincoln Rose Goody, the librarian and naturalist, Smokestack Lightning, an aged Apache medicine man, Baba, the toadstool visionary, townspeople called him the idiot, her infant son, two dogs, her bear, a turtle, and Stanislaw, 17-year-old exiled Prince of Poland and rock and roll singer who was currently Amanda's suitor. Having fed her friends a picnic lunch of acorn flour biscuits, goat cheese, gooseberry preserves, and ice mint tea, Amanda was seated in the lotus position atop a stump with the others on the turf at her feet. She was wearing a peasant blouse, lace knickers, and blackfoot beads and as earlier mentioned, was talking in a serious manner. Unless they have been to Colombia, down near the emerald mines of Muzzo, no American has even seen the blue phantom, Amanda complained. That would be Morpho Cypress, Madam Goody chimed in cheerfully. Yes, nodded Amanda. We have nothing on this continent to equal the metallic azure luminescence of that superb creature. And think of the death's headhawk moth with its banded moon gold body actually robbing honey from the hives of Southern Europe. And think too, my friends, of the gorgeous, silky, shallow tail brightening the treetops of New Guinea. And think, that's Acherantia atropis and Papilio Codras Medon interrupted Madame Goody. Abanda gave the plump little librarian a long piercing look and was about to say, Madame Goody, I do not give a rusty goddamn what these butterflies are called in Greek. When she relaxed and smiled, she thought to herself, so the scholars are tedious. The experts never see the whole truth of things. 
Still, they have their role to play. But although she said nothing, she made it clear to the others that it was the beauty and mystery of the butterflies that interested her and not scientific nomenclature. Did you know that Brooks Birdwing is so huge that in Sumatra it is often mistaken for a bird in flight? How grand it would be if in our own meadows we could be startled by the beat of its black velvet and spinach green wings. The Ornithopteria brookiana, er, that is Brooks Birdwing, said Madam Goody, frequents paths that have been fouled by urine. Your baby, she pointed to Amanda's son, is already doing his best to make the bird wing feel at home here. Amanda giggled. I would also like to see the tropical cast did. The male of that species are very quarrelsome, Madam Goody warned. Living among my father's orchids, said Amanda, and in all our parks and gardens. So Amanda outlined her plan. Stanislaus Band, the capitalist pig, would soon be making a world tour. Amanda could contact foreign naturalists and collectors who, in midnight rendezvous in secret groves or rowdy waterfront bars, would supply Stanislaw and his fellow musicians with the eggs or larvae of many an exotic moth. The band members would hide these specimens inside their instruments, taped within the bells of guitars, concealed inside the hollows of drums, snug among the tubes of amplifiers. The ancient occupation of smuggling would be embraced in order to enrich the entomological resources of America. And so it came to pass. Alas, however, custom agents at Kennedy International Airport discovered and seized this noble contraband. The entire membership of the capitalist pig was imprisoned. And almost immediately, a rumor swept the land that butterfly eggs would get you high. The woods and fields were overrun by unlikely looking entomologists and a sudden demand arose for nets, tweezers, magnifying glasses, and the other trappings of zoology's most vast and gentle branch. My dear Amanda, intoned the family lawyer, it has come to my attention that you are increasingly seen in the company of extremely weird individuals. Brushing a cigar ash from the attorney's somber necktie, Amanda corrected him. There is no such thing as a weird human being. It's just that some people require more understanding than others. My dear Amanda, ventured her father, he was enormously fat, while I do not subscribe to the old saw that a woman's place is in the kitchen, still I think it a salubrious thing when a young female undertakes to become expert in the culinary arts. However, it gives me little pleasure to learn that you have acquired a surprisingly wide reputation for the quality of your marijuana breads. In fact, I understand that you are sometimes called the Betty Crocker of the underground. What am I to tell our relatives and friends? Let them eat cake, said Amanda, gesturing benevolently. Amanda signed on as a clairvoyant with the Indo-Tibetan Circus and Giant Panda Gypsy Blues Band then touring the Pacific seaboard. The fetus at the time was no bigger than a pocket watch, but already it huffed against Amanda's bladder. And as the troopers motored up Highway 101, they stopped frequently at gas stations where their intentions most certainly were not to fill her up. This did not annoy Amanda, for it had long been her theory that human beings were invented by water as a device for transporting itself from one place to another. Amanda read the future in tarot cards. She consulted the I Ching. She even practiced a spot of palmistry. Her principal duty with the traveling show, however, was to give consultations while in the wakeful sleep of self-induced trance. For the privilege of her psychic readings, customers paid a $4.98 fee. But membership, for Amanda at least, was not as cut and dried and businesslike as the foregoing might imply. From the time of her puberty, she felt herself able to register 
the subtle and delicate vibrations of that area of collective consciousness we call the spirit world. As she grew older and more practiced, she found it easier to enter trance, and the trances themselves became more substantial and were of longer duration. In short, she assumed a certain amount of control. However, mediumship is never an exact science, and for Amanda it was a clear risk. There were other occasions when they had registered erratically or got completely out of hand. For example, one muggy evening in Santa Barbara, just before a shattering electrical storm, Amanda suddenly broke contact with the voices who were speaking through her about the marital problems of a well-dressed female customer. After a minute of static and babble, she launched into what might properly be described as a philosophical discourse. The most important thing in life is style, that is the style of one's existence. The characteristic mode of one's action is basically ultimately what matters. For if man defines himself by doing, then style is doubly definitive because style describes the doing. Amanda expounded upon this at some length. The point is this, she said eventually, happiness is a learned condition. And since it is learned and self-generating, it does not depend upon external circumstances for its perpetuation. This throws a very ironic light on content and underscores the primacy of style. After nearly an hour's monologue, she summed up by remarking, it is content, or rather the consciousness of content, that fills the void. But the mere presence of content is not enough. It is the style that makes us care. Whereupon the customer who had waited patiently throughout the speech clouded Amanda on the head with her handbag and demanded her $4.98 back. About 13 months ago, John Paul Ziller married a pregnant gypsy, brought two garter stakes and a tzitzi fly, and on the Seattle to Vancouver freeway, opened a roadside zoo. The garter stakes were quite ordinary specimens. The tzitzi fly was not even alive. The gypsy turned out to be half Irish and half Puerto Rican and was not pregnant long. She suffered a miscarriage after falling in a hole one night while out in the brush with an army surplus flashlight catching mice to feed the snakes. Eventually, however, both the marriage, Ziller's second, and the business venture, his first, did in a curious way succeed. Even before the corpse arrived, he had in wife and zoo a very definite roadside attraction. As the reader must have guessed, the gypsy who Mr. Ziller took to wife was Amanda, then 20 years of age and swelling with her second indiscretion. For those who savor the usually suspect facts of romantic love, an attempt will be made to render the details of the meeting, the courtship, and the wedding. But first, in the interest of exposition, a biographical note. John Paul Ziller was born in the Congo, that was all, born there. When he was one year old, his missionary parents returned to America and John Paul spent the rest of his childhood in Lutheran Parsonage in Olympia, Washington. But he was born in Africa, that made a difference. When a Tarzan film would come to Olympia, John Paul would be at every screening in the front row with his little friends telling them loudly, I was born in that jungle there. I used to swing on them vines. No kid in his neighborhood could play Jungle Jim or Tim Tyler without hiring, for gun balls, 
John Paul as technical advisor. He could describe the poisons with which certain pygmies smeared their arrows. He knew that Simba was a Swahili word for lion. The fact that he gathered that information from the library books, which he devoured like cookies, was of no consequence. He had been born in the jungle. He really had. By high school, most of the children of Olympia had outgrown the games of Tarzan. Ostensibly, John Paul had too. Maybe he was not quite like the others, but he was no freak. He was the best drummer the school dance band ever had, and he made good grades, especially in art. Those masks he carved were terrific. Although he was well over six feet tall, he did not play basketball, and sometimes his obvious disdain for competitive sports elicited physical attacks from some jock who doubted John Paul's patriotism. His virility, however, was never questioned. After all, he had been the first male in his set to have the courage to visit Big Ruth's in Aberdeen, where he was said to have gotten all to which his five dollars entitled him. And he was the first boy to go the limit with Elizabeth Lee Franklin, thereby launching her long and dedicated career. Such feats ensured his popularity with the boys and with the girls, well, John Paul was lean and mysterious and sophisticated and golly mom, He's better than any drummer I ever heard on the radio or anywhere. If one accepted his devotion to music and sculpture as normal, then John Paul's only peculiarity seemed to be a kind of exaggerated romanticism in which he sat as a deity in an aura. He was a dreamer who entertained exotic visions of himself, visions related to what he obviously regarded as his ties to another zone perhaps another time. When a chaperone caught him drinking beer at the junior prom, he asked, John Paul, what makes you so darn wild? Is it because your dad's a preacher? John Paul got that funny smug look in his eyes and said, it's in my blood, Mr. Yarber. When I was born, the drums of Kivu beat all night long. The hyenas ate my afterbirth. Soon after graduation, John took his late father's insurance money. Fortunately, the old parson had not taken his, quote, God will provide, in quote, sermon so literally as to ignore the man from Fidelity Life, and was off to Paris, quote, to study art, end quote. The next that Olympia saw of him was three years later when he showed up with a fantastic mustache and a young baboon on a leash. The Indo-Tibetan Circus and Giant Panda Gypsy Blues Band being a somewhat unorthodox troupe often aroused the ire of policemen, pastors, and purse-lipped ladies. Those vigilant citizens who saw in the exotic trappings of the traveling show folk a manifestation of some unnamed conspiracy to subvert their political moral prerogatives. Generally, however, as a result of the manager's buttery tongue, rustic diplomacy, and thoughtful monetary donations, the show was allowed to go on. As they say, and by and large, those community elders who reviewed the performance would agree that while some of it was weirdly incomprehensible, it had entertaining and even educational features, and was likely to turn their children into communists, desperados, and fiends. So while the troop frequently was sideswiped by the machinery of law and righteousness, it deftly avoided a head-on collision until one mid-August dawn in Sacramento. Some say the orders came from California's glamorous governor himself, although there was scant proof to generally involve the gov, no matter. The raid at whoever's instigation did occur, and after each member of the circus had been harassed, intimidated, 
and thoroughly searched, the girls' vaginas were explored for hidden vials, eight of the troopers were hauled into jail on charges of possession of narcotics. Although the substance found by the police was not a narcotic, but merely the mild, euphoric marijuana, the law being somewhat remiss in making the proper pharmacological distinctions. Those 40 or so troopers not arrested, this group included Amanda and her baby son, moved to an isolated spot on the Sacramento River some miles out of town. There, they arranged their silver milk wagons, star-spangled VW microbuses, motorcycles, and mystery emblem 50 Dodge panel trucks in a circle, camping inside its circumference in the manner of early American pioneers. For two weeks, they feasted, danced, swam, fished, read, rested, practiced their acts, and awaited the trial of their companions. When justice came, she was not quite as predatory as some had feared. Two troopers had their cases dismissed for lack of evidence. Four were released with fines and suspended sentences. The remaining two, however, were second offenders, and they received prison terms of five years each. One of these had been aroused about, and the circus manager replaced him easily with one of the young unemployed cowboys who had taken to hanging around the Sacramento River campsite. For the other, unfortunately, a substitute could not so quickly be found. He was Palumbo, the drummer, whose prior conviction had been for smuggling butterfly eggs in the hollow of his base. And in order to drum with the giant panda, one had not only to be versed in the blues rock tradition, but had to have a musicological knowledge and polyrhythmic aptitudes so as to help weave those esoteric and eclectic textures in which the giant panda specialized. Since there were several weeks of good bookings awaiting the circus in Oregon and Washington, dates that must be kept if the show was to finish the season in the black, the manager and the band leader pulled the most roadworthy vehicle out of the encampment and sped down to San Francisco in search of a suitable drummer. Days passed. An occasional northbound traveler would stop by the encampment to deliver the message. No chops yet. On the 10th day, in the midst of a late communal breakfast of toasted puffball mushrooms, Linko Perdon Jamatum, Madam Lincoln Rose O'Grady would have called them, yogurt and fresh pine needle tea, the missing band squealed into camp, smiles hanging out of both windows. We got us a drummer. God almighty, yes, we do have us a drummer. And you, do you know what drummer we got? Ringo Starr asked a mouth full of puffball. We got John Paul Ziller, the manager cheered. He's going to join us here in two or three days. Around the breakfast fire, there rose a loud buzzing. Many troopers were excited, others clearly puzzled. Amanda, for example, was certain she'd heard of the new drummer. She could not readily identify him. Well, by this time next week, every man, woman, and child in the civilized world may know the name Ziller and for whom it stands. But for the present, it must be assumed Ziller is, to the general public, a non-entity. Therefore, the writer calls for additional biographical notes. Part one, occupation blank. On the billion of varied, yet somehow identical forms in whose linear receptacles, parentheses blank, Western man deposits the salient data of his being upon whose tiny empty lots parentheses blank, he erects the established facts of his identity on those forms, tax statements, credit applications, mortgage papers, divorce papers, social security forms, insurance policies, 
selective service examinations, job applications, census surveys, police blotters, rental leases, passports, medical records, ad infinitum. Near the tops of those forms, not far from the open spaces provided for such carnal intelligence as name, blank, comma, address, blank, comma, sex, blank, and marital status, blank, comma. There is an area of perhaps an inch in length and one eighth of an inch in height for the confession of one's occupation, blank, period. Even John Paul Ziller, although more loosely rooted in the hard pan of traditional behavior than most men, was forced from time to time to fill in forms. Adwin Zeller would come to occupation, blank, comma, he always wrote, quote, magician, end quote. Now, as the reader shall soon learn, whatever compensation Ziller earned prior to the opening of the Roadside Zoo came from his artistic endeavors, visual and or musical. And while there is no little magic in the arts, particularly the way that Ziller practiced them, it must be assumed that in calling himself a magician, John Paul was speaking figuratively and, face it, pretentiously. Yet in reviewing Ziller's life, as some have been wont to do these past few days, one concludes that, quote, magician, end quote, probably covers his activities as well as any other occupational description. After all, it is indicative of some kind of appropriateness when a CIA agent says of a fugitive, as one said yesterday of Ziller, we'll tear this country apart if necessary to get our hands on that fucking magician. Biographical Notes Part 2 Never prolific as a sculptor, it has been several years now since Ziller has exhibited at all, yet few articles on avant-garde art are published that do not refer to his contribution. That the authors seldom are in agreement as to the nature of his contribution only supports the general notion of his significance. The non-vibrating astrological dodo dome spectacular was his masterpiece. About that there is no quarrel. When it was unveiled at the Whitney Museum of American Art, it brought to its obscure young creator the art world equivalent of the kind of instant notoriety a starlet achieves when she successfully pulls a film out from under the weight of a veteran and venerated actress. It was saluted as a tour de force and cursed as a scandal. Some critics were afraid to acknowledge it, others afraid not to. When a representative of the New York Times called at Ziller's studio for an interview, she was received by a near-naked, savage-looking man who stopped playing his clay flute only long enough to insist that the complex electrochemical sculpture in question actually had been executed by his pet baboon. Biographical Note, Part 3. The prominent Jan Stelly Gallery presented Ziller's first one-man show of Cosmos Mystique Apparati. These were fiberglass pyramids and cones, volcano-like, about five feet tall. Some were covered with the skins of poisonous reptiles, others with the feathers of small gray birds. Others were painted in translucent whites and pinks, often with a bulb of weak light bulging in the bowels of the fiberglass like some frosty hemorrhoid or mathematical pun. Near the base of each piece was riveted a small brass plate, which read, quote, upon proper viewing, the external surface heat of this apparatus may reach 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. At that temperature, old master techniques are known to fail, end quote. Biographical Notes, Part 4. The Jan Stelly Gallery is proud to present an exhibition of ready-made fossils created by John Paul Ziller, 
who has recently returned from his travels in Africa, or was it India? The artist had carved from ivory, alabaster, and onyx replicas of important archaeological tidbits, the jawbone of a Java man, skull fragments of a Marms man, telltale arm sockets from Tanganyika. Ziller chose to display these half concealed in mounds of sand or mud, which he had dumped on the gallery floor upon two or more striking pieces, embossed with gold, vats of fresh garbage had been poured, and the largest piece was buried beneath a pile of offal Ziller had gathered along the bridle paths of Central Park. Naturally, as the days wore on, the exhibition began to engage senses other than sight and touch, offering somewhat of a challenge to olfactory aesthetics. Biographical Notes, Part 5. At the same time that Ziller was itching the visual art world with his fossils, apparati, post-lumer illuminated Buddha turds and magnetic jade divining rods, helpful in locating the lost city of Mu, his reputation as a drummer was running like a vine along the invisible walls of the music underground. In those days, he blew jazz, chiefly of the Afro-Cuban variety. Such was his ability that he was welcomed at the jazz sessions of the top jazz men in New York, and on occasion he sat in during gigs at famous clubs such as the Half Note, the Five Spot, and the Village Gate, drumming in the bata fashion while using an African thumb harp for orchestral effect, since it was rumored that he had turned down chairs in some very fine combos there was an eddy of interest in the musical undercurrent when word flashed around that Ziller was about to organize his own band. Zali Abraham, who both promoted jazz and wrote books about it, visited Ziller with a twofold plan. One, he would contract Ziller's group for a New England campus tour, and two, he would write an article on the aims of the new band for Downbeat magazine. It was a warm autumn day, and Ziller and his baboon were seated on a Nigerian cotton cushion in front of an open window, eating plums and listening to the sounds that bounced in off the street. There was a smell of carbon in the air. Upon hearing Abraham's proposal, Ziller, yellow berries of plum juice hanging from the hairs of his mustache, replied, quote, The jazz was the very same shape as the keyhole, so that went through. The blues was lean and conditioned to suffering, so it snug through. But the rock was big like a sausage and got stuck in the middle ear to the ground, end quote. Pretty pissed, Abraham went away and informed all the jazz heads that Ziller was insane and an opportunist to boot. He had sold out to rock and roll. In the mashed banana sunlight of Labor Day morning, Amanda basked on a log in the Sacramento River, talking to her two closest friends in the Indo-Tibetan circus, nearly normal Jimmy and Smokestack Lightning, a burly redhead whose walrus nose and oxblood mustache both drooped warily as if overpowered by the weight of his ice cube thick spectacles, Nearly normal Jimmy was manager and ringmaster of the circus. An administrative genius, nearly normal, had been a childhood playmate of Amanda's and had befriended her again after he dropped out of the University of Arizona Business School to manage and produce the capitalist pig. It had been this myopic red pug who introduced Amanda to Stanislaw. And it was the same nearly normal who recruited her for the circus. It was he too who found a job for Palumbo, the ill-fated drummer after Stanislaw had been deported and the capitalist pig disbanded. At 73, Smokestack Lightning 
could do a dance that lowered the blood temperature of the most urbane and confident white America. The, in the circus arena, lit only by a dry twig fire, the old Apache would don his ghost shirt, its blue-dyed buckskin adorned with thunderbirds and fat white stars, a design that had been revealed to the shirt's original owner in a vision, then he would commence a performance of calculated frenzy, identifying his bodily rhythms with the historical migrations of his people, recalling both their triumphs and their tribulations, insinuating their glories and humiliations, howling myths in the shadow like a coyote, clacking his peyote-stained teeth like a beaver, arching his back like a mesa, planting his toes like the dawn of agriculture, weeping like a long winter, laughing like the mouth of a river, stalking with his arrowed eyes some unlicensed prey in the faces of the audience. And the audience would sit chilled, bound to the stake of congenital guilt, its thoughts paddling along some quiet piney lake or spurring a pony around the bend of a canyon, all trails, however, clean and simple leading to the scene of slaughter, the wood smoke ribboning from the dancer's tiny fire filtered through cinemascope and dime novels and TV tubes and Jungian memory to sting the spectator's eyes with metaphors of barbaric lust, as if it were the gun smoke and torch smoke still lingering from some old wounded knee meadow of battle cooking their hearts over the embers of once bright genocide. And when the drums suddenly froze and the hard mahogany Indian stilled his dance at the summit of its demonic power to shriek in perfect mad pie trickster, to scream in flawless American, Hi Niswat Vita Kini, we shall live again, the stoutest, of mechanics cough nervously and children and women were known to pee in their pants. Smokestack Lightning also executed an expurgated version of the Hopi Rain Dance using live rattlesnakes when he could get away with it. The deputy sheriffs in some towns forced him to substitute non-poisonous serpents in the interest of public safety. Incidentally, it was a couple of those garter snake substitutes that the newlywed Zillers purchased to stock their roadside zoo, although the reader doesn't have to be burdened with all those details now, does he? Amanda plopped her feet in the cool water. What truly mystifies me, she confided to her friends, is the way things are always happening to me during thunderstorms my oddest experiences, the ones that are the most occult or that seem to seep out of the deepest cracks in my psyche invariably happen just before or in the middle of some storm. I mean, it's spooky, as if there's some connection between my innermost karmic structure and violent electrical disturbances. Why do you suppose that is? All squinty-eyed, Nearly normal Jimmy was wiping river spray from his glasses with a brakeman's bandana. People's heads are always affected by thunderstorms, he allowed. It's the negative particles released in the atmosphere. Ozone gas is released too. It activates the mind, makes you feel kind of high. Haven't you ever noticed feeling kind of high just before a storm? People dream more more vividly when there's a heavy concentration of ozone in the air. They've proved this in scientific experiments. Did you know that if you take an IQ test during a thunderstorm or just before one hits, you'll make a higher score than you normally would? That's a fact. Activates the brain. Shit, baby, you're like everybody else. Just more sensitive, that's all. Thunder is sky power, said Smokestack Lightning, very different from the powers of Earth and Under-Earth. Much war 
come between power above and power below. Maybe war between the head of Amanda and the body of Amanda? No, maybe not so. Thunder is season power. Always come before spring season. Make corn grow. Make trees catch flower. Thunder friendly spirit, but big clumsy sometimes break things. Maybe Amanda have big spirit in her. Big power, sky power. But she cannot understand, because she woman. Also have earth power. Earth is woman. Woman is earth. What's so big sky power doing in woman? The Indian's voice faded. It was nearly noon. The day had an edge of real heat now. Amanda was wearing a little shift of off-white organdy, which she had picked up at the Sears store in San Luis Obispo, and to the neckline of which she had sewn peacock feathers and beads of black glass. It was a thin textile, and she wore no bra. The sun warmed her chest like a vapor rub. Very relaxed, she had mulled over her companion's explanation of the thunderstorm syndrome for just a minute or two, when she became aware of a fourth person, a stranger, in their midst. Smokestack had noticed the intruder first, but said nothing. Finally, nearly normal, turned to see him too. The man was Caucasian, but the color of a good cigar. He was quite tall, maybe six, four, or five, and slender. Two pounds of Fiji hair sat upon his head like the barbed wire nest of a mechanical bird. His face was long and gaunt and wild, his eyes piercing, his mouth fierce, his mustache mockingly extravagant. He wore a sorcerer's cape, yellowed celestial secrets on a field of side real blue over a vest shirt of some reddish leather to which Amanda could not identify. Trousers, he wore none, but rather a parrot green loincloth. His feet were sandaled. About his forehead was tied a narrow band of giraffe skin. In one bejeweled hand, he held a primitive clay flute. Towering above the trio on the river log, he was an imposing figure, a bit like an ancient Egyptian ruler, especially Egyptian because of his strange tumul eyes. His pupils seemed to remain in the center, even when his face was in profile. Nearly normal was so startled by the presence of the man that it was a moment before he recognized him. Of course, it wasn't the man's attire that surprised the ringmaster. Among nearly normal's troopers' eccentricity was the uniform of the day. No, it was his stealth, the manner in which he suddenly had materialized on the log without a warning sound. Like a magician, eh? But shock speedily gave way to pleasure. Amanda, smokestack lightning, let me present the legendary John Paul Ziller. I've been telling you about him. Self-exiled from the international art scene, leader and drummer of the Hoodoo Beat Bucket until he split for Africa, or was it India? The lean man stared only at Amanda. He was pensive. When finally he spoke, the voice that fell from his ferocious lips was both jarring and vulnerable like a bloodshot eye. There was something of the Negro bluesman in it and something of the Shakespearean stage. No one recalls his exact language, but they remember that it was spicy with portent. He awakened in Amanda's consciousness the image of the monarch, the pharynging, high-flying, black and orange butterfly that is one of your most familiar insects. He reminded her that the monarch's nickname is Storm King. That is always most active before a storm. She had seen them, hadn't she? Sailing in the electrified air, beating head on into the gusty thunder clouds, revealing in the boisterous winds. And did she not know that monarchs usually emerge from their cocoons just prior to thunderstorms? 
The first sound they hear is likely the rumble of thunder. They are literally born of the storm. No other creature is so susceptible to the tense vibrations of a summer squall, a butterfly. Somewhere in its minute mechanism is a device that responds to and perhaps assimilates the gestalt of the storm. If there were some psychological or physiological link between Amanda and this butterfly, some unusual rapport. Amanda's mouth eased into a long, slow smile. Her eyes grew as bright as violent silk. Yes, yes, she muttered, the monarch. She stared at Ziller. He at her. They modified each other by their looking. Something almost angelic danced on the abrasive surfaces of his face. She carried her excitement lightly, the way a hunter carries a loaded shotgun over a fence. Warm chemical yolks burst in their throats. Ziller had the stink of pan about him. Amanda heard the phone ring in her room. In the magnetized space between them, they flew their thoughts like kites. For At all last, his courtly title, the, the monarch, monarch she took his house, hand as they disappeared the far Thank down you, the Madame river bank. The is the most down home the Apache sat, of butterflies stunned, that is before the they were virtually extirpated in the immediate by wake air pollution and pesticides. Turn. Monarchs were familiar figures in most American neighborhoods. They fluttered their zigzag course as if under the orders of some secret navigator whose logic was as fanciful as true across backyards and vacant lots and swimming holes and fairgrounds and streets of towns and cities. They have been spotted from the observation deck of the Empire State Building by surprised tourists from Indiana who thought they had left such creatures down by the barn. Indeed, wherever there is access to milkweed, Asclepius Syriaca, let's not carry this too far, Madam G, there you will find monarchs, for the larvae of this species is as addicted to milkweed juice as the most strung out junkie to smack. His appetite is awesome in its singularity, for he would rather starve than switch. But if the monarch is or was a common domestic as old shoe as the folks next door, he is by no means a stay at home. Monarchs, in fact, constitute the jet set of the insect world. These butterflies, stronger flyers than many birds, are spectacularly migratory. In the first autumn chills, they gather, having cruised about individually all summer, in enormous flocks. Millions of them in good years, literally millions, mass for the journey south. On four-inch wings, they may trek for more than a thousand miles. Monarchs have migrated in all kinds of weather, from Canada to Florida, from Florida to Hawaii, from the Pacific Northwest to the Gulf of Mexico. At 20 miles an hour, it has taken some monarch movements five hours to pass a given point. Tides of them, miles wide galaxies, vast flowing rivers of insects staining the wind with their moody hues force fields of haphazardly modulated entities, notes in a numerical narrative, syllables of equal inflection, rhythmically pulsating, decreasing in optic tempo only on their peripheries where intensity and density finally slacken, as at the edge of a Jackson Pollock painting or the frayed ends of a patchwork quilt. To science, the migratory flights of the monarch remain a mystery, an enigma of tactics, if not of strategy. There are certain channels of communication that operate outside the frequencies of the most prying investigators. A hundred blackbirds will evacuate a tree at precisely the same second without a discernible signal of any kind. A variety of orchid lacking nectar as an enticement but needing to be pollinated, 
attracts male bees by emitting odors like that of the female bee. A wasp will bore for an hour into the hardwood of a tree at the exact spot where it hides the tiny grub in whose body she lays her eggs. There is no outward sign that the grub is there, yet the wasp never misses. At the disposal of the quote, lower end quote, animals are invisible clocks and computers about which science can only speculate. Similarly, scientists have discovered and recorded quote, laws end quote, to which electricity, gravity, and magnetism adhere, but they have practically no understanding of what these forces are or why. It would seem that there exists in the time-space grid a system of natural order, a mathematics of energy whose, quote, numbers, end quote, are even more a riddle to us than their progressions. It is this arithmetic of consciousness that more simple men call the, quote, supernatural, end quote. The mystery of migrating butterflies, the mystery of gravity and dreams are but operating arms of the great mystery, the perpetuation of which sustains us all. If that declaration has a taste of corn about it, so be it. Language grows a bit sticky in areas such as these. However, concerns of this nature can be quite practical and concrete, as we shall see. It is in the realm of high mystery that certain men and women are destined to act out their lives. For several hours, the couple walked in the landscape. They held hands, but did not speak. They dared not speak. Vast energies flowed between them. With the sun, they formed the points of a radiant triangle. Blood pools sang in their temples. Their hot breath was dispersed in the fields. Toward mid-afternoon, one of the pangs in Amanda's belly became gradually familiar. For her, it was the recognition of a single instrument into symphonic crescendo. Assuming Ziller was hungry too, she broke his hold at last and began to forage. She gathered acorns and puff balls in the skirt of her dress. She dug dandelion roots with her nails. These items with cloves of wild garlic, she skewered on slivers and toasted over a fire that Ziller made without matches. A farm wife approached cautiously and offered them peaches and almonds. Amanda presented her Madame Blavatsky wristwatch in return. The country woman declined but accepted a peacock plume. It was the first time Amanda saw Ziller's smile. She detected filed teeth and a reserve of joy. I am told you are somewhat of a wanderer, she said. Her tongue was thick with peach juice. It turned in his ear like a key. That is not correct, he answered. I travel a great deal, but I never wander. Then I assume you move about with direction. What is your usual destination? The source. I am always voyaging back to the source. You must initiate me in the science of origins. I suspect your travels are soaked with adventure. Ziller drew from a hidden pocket in his cape a journal, yes, the journal, and began to read random pages aloud. At a cruel souvenir, stand beside a dry water hole, we check our maps against the extended umbilicus of a shaman. He reveals to us the hidden meanings of our moles and the deeper significances of our snoring from the vines upon which he travels first class in that free space between heaven and earth, the lord of the jungle dives into the translucent river, disappears with her beneath the giant lily pads. Quiet, a few bright birds throw themselves against the cheek of the humidity. Silence, a hippopotamus slumps like a lobotomy in the vegetating stream. Not a sound, the hippo yawns, disclosing his marshmallow gums. Peace, the bubbling of Jane's orgasm. 
We breakfast at the all-night Sanskrit clinic and sunshine posts. Phosphorescent toadstools illuminate the musicians. Ghost cookies sparkle with opium. We learn the language of the dream wheel. Forward the march, the burden and the glow. We are approaching our destination. The sky is filled with messages, the color of spires. Butterflies as big as tennis rackets flap around the base of the volcano. We stop long enough to synchronize our religions. A white hunter shows up and fills our pockets with omens and terrible trophies of Felix the Cat. Fragments. They had Amanda bubbling like her baby. First she wanted to inquire about those big butterflies. Larger than Brooks Birdwing? Surely she would have read of them. But before she could blurt out one thrilled question, Ziller said to her, I am told you are a gypsy and a clairvoyant in the bargain. Does that mean that you too are a traveler? I am a gypsy in spirit only, she confessed. I travel in gardens and bedrooms, basements and attics, around corners, through doorways and windows, along sidewalks, upstairs, over carpets, down drain pipes, in the sky, with friends, lovers, children, and heroes, perceived, remembered, imagined, distorted, and clarified. Ziller was pleased. He played his flute for her, gave her a ring whose ruby setting had been chipped from the great eye of Delhi, whispered his secret name to her, stood guard each time she went behind a bush, the day's excitement added to the pressures on her bladder, and asked her to become his wife. Amanda sang for him with the seven peyote hymns of the Arapaho, gave him the scarab out of her navel, told him her secret name, and said, of course. Finished with sun and passion, they floated back to camp and into the flailing arms of a celebration. When she was a small girl, Amanda hid a ticking clock in an old rotten tree trunk. It drove woodpeckers crazy. Ignoring tasty bugs all around them, they just about beat their brains out trying to get at the clock. Years later, Amanda used the woodpecker experiment as a model for understanding capitalism, communism, Christianity, and all other systems that traffic in future rewards rather than in present realities. Obviously, nearly normal Jimmy had sent the union for he had driven into Sacramento and procured gallons of 11 cellars sauterne. The new rustabout contributed a quarter kilo of locally grown grass, Rio Linda Green, a portion of which Takamichi, the tiny Zen tea master, had boiled, whisked, and steeped into a most expensive brew. Under the direction, nuclear Phyllis, motor scooter devil and granddaughter of a U.S. senator, the woman had concocted an immense stew of potatoes, onions, burdock tubers, and freshly netted trout. Having served its culinary function, the cook fire had subsequently been built into a roaring, spitting, leaping blaze that roged the evening sky with foxy hues and made the river canyon seem a cauldron not unwitch-like in character. Near the fire, the band, with smokestack lightning sitting on Palumbo's abandoned drums, was into something ornamental and ceremonious, an adaptation of a rare, hours-long tantric raga, which the ancients had reserved exclusively for lunar eclipses and the nuptials of important personages. Amanda and John Paul were seated on a painted log and garlanded with chrysanthemums that had been recently liberated from a suburban lawn. The lovers refused stew and wine, but accepted bowls of tea. After toasts, Amanda's son, dressed in a tunic of rabbit fur and yellow brocade, was fetched from the nursery van to meet his new father and to kiss his mother goodnight. Ziller could scarcely believe the child's eyes. 
They seemed almost electric. 10 or 15 minutes of silence followed the climax of the band's special selection. The players were exhausted and the listeners transfixed. Then nearly normal, sweet with wine and giggly with brass, delivered a short address in which he attributed the events of the day to Tibetan intervention, although exactly how that far off nation interposed itself, he did not say. Up is up, down is down, and Tibet is Tibet, said Jimmy reasonably. You may scoff, but I know what I know. He introduced Ziller to the musicians and troopers, for most of them had encountered him only in myth and innuendo, and he announced officially this time the union. In word and smile and kiss, the performers paid their respects. It was apparent that Amanda was sharply loved by all. When the band began again to play, it worked into an impromptu arrangement of Barbie Doll's Hysterectomy, a little number from the repertoire of the Hoodoo Meat Bucket. This, of course, in honor of Ziller, who, toward the end of the piece, was persuaded to relieve the old Apache on drums. Oh my, yes, yes. Everything they'd heard was true, in and out of the melody, crossing the beat like a jaywalker dodging taxi cabs, accentuating the offbeats, creating counterbeats. He drummed like a thousand-handed deity, Quan Yin, all arms and bliss. Next, a Raga Rock rendition, San Ziller, of, quote, Black Doorman, end quote, the rhythms of which pulled dancers singularly or in pairs into the reeling wheel of firelight. Most of the troopers were rolling their own ecstasy now, dancing, singing, climbing trees, moon watching, it was mango orange and as thin as tortilla, eating, drinking, necking, dreaming, goofing, groping, trephinating, frescoing their pineal glands with the cardinal brush, Takamishi swaying in an American flag hammock, intoning his great wooden beads, nuclear Phyllis and the new roustabout skinny dipping in the stream. Only Amanda and Ziller, arm in arm, on the log of honor, seemed restless. Noticing this, although his spectacles were sticky with wine, nearly normal led them away. Now Amanda, who traveled in the nursery truck, owned a lovely little goat wool teepee, and on the rear of his motorcycle, John Paul carried an Arabian tent. But believing that honeymooners should engage in neutral territory, nearly normal, and some other troopers had taken the liberty of constructing a hasty hut of sticks and boughs. It sat the length of a spaghetti dinner outside the larger, as Ziller, with his knowledge of South African wagon trains called the circular camp, protected by an outcropping of rock. Instead, the ground was covered with Amanda's own Persian carpet. In the corner sat a small wedding gift table of carved quartz on top of which were carefully arranged Ziller's compass, sextant, charts, telescope, French ticklers, and other navigational instruments. From the ceiling hung a brass saucer in which nearly normal had thought to burn incense until he remembered Amanda having once told him that smell was 80% of love. Here the couple was left, the sounds of the festivities seeping through the walls like some disjointed music of Mars. Moonlight pressed in on them like a hungry ghost feeding on the wholeness of their hearts and brains. But as they sat undressing on the edge of the bedroll, each trying to please the other with gesture and look, a spike of tension suddenly drove between them, prying them apart. It appears that the gypsy traveler has taken on a passenger, Ziller said dryly, observing her through his antique spyglass. Yes, I'm afraid I have been outfitted as a vessel, Amanda lowered her lashes and crossed her arms in front of her slightly bulging belly. Was it someone in the circus or band? No, no, it was a lonely writer I met one stormy day in Laguna Beach. He had a poem about Thelonious Monk 
that he sealed in a tin can labeled Campbell's Cream of Potato Soup. Later I heard he killed himself to avoid the draft. A moment of fidgety silence, a tentative embrace, then Amanda's turn. I've heard that you were married before, John Paul. What happened? Where is she now? And so forth. She was the daughter of a Kansas City meatpacker, a frail debutante sopping up culture while working as a secrecy for my gallery in New York. On our wedding trip, we went to Ceylon to hunt flying foxes, a species of bat. One became entangled in my bride's hair and I woke to find her squeaking like a dying bat while hanging naked upside down from a rafter. Soon afterward, she entered an asylum. Her daddy had everything efficiently annulled. Now I understand she's one of the leading socialites in Kansas City, though subject to embarrassing attacks. One night at the opera, mm, another sickening silence. Both were ashamed of their indulgences. They could sense a taint on their karmas. Gradually, however, Scylla climbed into a smile. From Amanda, a different giggle. In a moment, two of them were laughing. Freely and deliriously, like children, tickled in their cribs by a roguish uncle, their mouths smashed together hotly, moistly. His gentle hand kneaded her breasts, then slid down her belly and into her panties. Her clitoris perked like a bug, buzzed like a cicada. He grew masculine to an improper degree. Most of the night they did it, laughing and biting. Waking in the morning with rhinestone crustaceans on their eyelids and the butt end of a rainbow, filling their tiny room. The Pelican in bright California is one of those taverns that function as a neighborhood social club. There is a coin operated pool table of less than regulation size. There's a shuffleboard table that seems as much too long as the pool table seems too short. It looks like a land strip. There's a bowling machine and two pinballs. There is a library of punch boards, Black Cat, Texas Charlie, Lucky Dollar. There's a jukebox stuffed with country and western hits and the kind of Tin Pan Alley laments that sound poignant to the jilted and juiced. There are revolving wire Christmas trees laden with beef jerky and beer nuts. There are jars of boiled eggs and hot sausages and a larger jar in which pickles lounge like green Japanese in a bath. There is an animated plastic trout stream advertising Olympia beer. It's the water. There is a friendly middle-aged couple behind the bar. A lot of brewy laughter and first name calling jostles the smoke bank that hangs in the Pelican almost from ceiling to floor. The Pelican is in a shuffleboard league and competition is keen and boisterous when its team is matched against the tavern from Sacramento. But on that particular September evening, at a table near the bar, three men in their mid-twenties were in conversation, grave and angry. They've got a big fire of some kind going, said Bubba. Canyons lit up like the streets of hell. Yeah, you can hear that stupid music all the way over by Richie's diary, complained Fred. Hell, I heard it right here in the parking lot, said Bubba. Andy grunted and nodded. Well, look, said Fred, if a bunch of queers and niggers and sluts want to have an orgy, that's their business. But let them have it in San Francisco or L.A. or wherever they come from. Don't let them come around here and spread their filth. Folks around here don't want our shit. We got sisters out on dates tonight. Andy and I have out with decent boys. Those weirdos get full of that LDS. God knows what they might do. Got no morals, no respect for properties. 
There, you said it, Bubba jumped in hotly. No respect. No respect for authority. No respect for law and order. No damn respect for nothing. That's what the trouble is in this country today. Bunch of niggers and weirdos trying to tear down everything this country stands for. Falling right into the hands of the commies. Uncle Sam's in a bind overseas. You think they'll help? Shit, no. They want to dress up like cowboys and Indians. Go pick flowers. Make a bunch of loud noise and call it music. Want everybody to work and support them while they take a bunch of drugs and attack innocent people and God knows what all. Andy's big blonde head was bobbing like it was on the end of a pole. The other two took long pulls from their schooners. Wiping his mouth, Fred said, Ain't there something the sheriff can do about that riffraff? Let's go have a talk with the deputy. I've scum around for three weeks now. What are we paying the cops for? Already talked to Dick, said Bubba, belching. They already nailed him once, you know. Searched him. Took about eight of them off to jail. Rest of them hid their dope and needles somewhere. God, you should have heard what Dick said about those broads. None of them wears any underwear. Anyway, they can't bother him for a while, I guess. Unless they get some complaints. Queer's got permission to be on that land. And the Cleavers, who own the closest ranch, they ain't got to complain. Liberal Democrats and Unitarians to boot. Hell, their oldest boy, Billy's, joined up with them. Maybe we can go talk Richie into filing a complaint, said Fred. That music will curdle his milk. Maybe we ought to do a little complaining ourselves. Now you're getting the idea, hiss Bubba. Now you're talking, son. Three of us, we go pick up Spud and Joe. And Dick Wilding, he's off duty now. Hal, Dick will go. Six of us be plenty. Get us some axe handles, ball bats. Go over there. I mean, clean house. With the fear of God in them. They're just germs, you know. No more than germs or flies or rats. People that think to that level ain't fit to live in a country like this. Let's do Uncle Sam the favor and clean out the rat nest. Right, boy, right, said Fred. I didn't risk my life overseas to come home to something like this. I don't want my folks living around trash and traitors that sell their own country to the Reds for a bottle of pills. I say, run them right out of the country. Better than that, hang them. Andy was nodding and grunting and thinking of his baby sister. The trio finished its beer. Well, what are we waiting for, asked Bubba. You're waiting for somebody to turn your heads around straight, said a clear, calm voice from the bar. The three men looked up to find the stranger who had been sitting with his back to them in the nearest stool, now looking into their faces, smiling. The ladies and gentlemen whom you desire to assault are showmen, jugglers, firewalkers, and yogic acrobatics, whose mission it is to entertain and enrapture children of all ages. They bring into the lives of the ordinary Americans the color and splendor of the Orient, especially of those ancient cultures whose folkways have been abolished by communist invaders. They are no threat to your freedom, for it is the name of freedom that they perform their magical feats. Fred cocked his right arm and Andy growled. Both made a move to rise, but were restrained by Bubba. Bubba was more observant than his drinking companion. Perhaps that was why he was an auto part salesman and they laborers on the river docks. While the strangers had been talking, Bubba had been sizing him up. He was dressed in jeans and a black sweatshirt, and although his hair was fairly long, he was clean shaven and did not have the weirdo look. More importantly, he was built. Shoulders wide, hips narrow, biceps like eggplants shoved up his sleeves. He had moved very little on his bar stool, but the slightest turn of his head suggested a superb athletic race. He was a few years older than they looked, as if he'd caught a few punches, although not enough to scar his face. This joker would go through Andy or Fred like shit through a tall Swede, mused Bubba. He wouldn't be a pushover even for me. Bubba was discreet. You from around here, buddy? He asked in his no-nonsense John Wayne baritone. No, I work for a logging outfit up near Aberdeen, Washington, the stranger explained in his willowy drawl. 
been whoring around San Francisco for days, and now I'm about to deliver a bab, a pet to a friend of mine here. My name is Plucky Purcell. There was no activity in front of Bubba's brain. He looked the stranger over well, his eyes squinting, his mind wrestling with uncomfortableness of association. The trade ends of his thought pattern seemed to bleed into the stranger's space, merging with him in some sweep of self-canceling perception. And then he hit a pot it, or rather tripped over it, fell on top of it, held it down like a farm boy trapping a pig. Purcell, Bubba purred slowly. Plucky Purcell. Say, you ain't the Purcell who played ball. The one who stole... Yeah, you are him, ain't you, huh? Bubba's teeth showed big and yellow inside a heavy timber cat grin. His jowls were candy rag. Well, said Purcell with hesitation, all that happened a long time ago. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Bubba was squealing, laughing, jumping up and down in his chair like a baby. Hey, guys, this is Plucky Purcell. Remember about 10 years ago? Hey, Purcell, come over here and let me buy you a brew. How about telling us about that mess, huh? Tell me what really happened. Oh, shit, boys. When do you hear this, am I? Gentlemen, I don't really relish heating up those old cold chestnuts. But I'll make a deal with you. I'll tell you about my little escapade if you'll come peacefully with me out to where that circus is camped. I want you to meet those folks. Get to know them a bit so you won't have fear or hate them as you do. Fred and Andy were not sure what was transpiring and they were less sure that they liked it. Bubba, however, was spastic with delight. Look, boys, he whispered, I just remembered. Spud and Joe are at the Stag Movies over to the Legion Hall. We couldn't get them to go anyway. Now just listen to this story. This Purcell's okay. So over a couple beers, Purcell told them a carefully rehearsed version of an event from the past. Then they left the Pelican, and after securing a pint of Seagram 7 from the glove compartment of Bubba's Mustang, they boarded Plucky's VW Microbus for a visit to the campsite. They had traveled only half a mile or so, past the bottle only once, when Fred yelled, Hey, who's this in the back of the wagon? You got a kid back there? Bubba whirled around and studied the shadowy figure in the rear. Kid, hell, he roared. That's an ape. Purcell's got a friggin' ape in here. Calm yourselves, gentlemen, and be humble. Purcell spoke with hermetic theatricality of Jean-Paul Ziller. You are in the presence of Mon Cole, the Prince of Van Boons. Mon Cole has been around the world eight times and met everybody twice. He is better educated than you or I and is the only creature on earth, man or beast, who knows an English word that rhymes with orange. Oh, crap, said Bubba. It's just a dumb ape. Come here, monkey. God, it's funny looking. Look at that big red ass. Come here, monkey. Come here and let me. Yeah! Jesus Christ, it bit me. Look! Son of a bitch nearly bit my finger off. Bubba thrust his arm over his shoulder seat between Purcell and Andy. Indeed, blood was crushing. Just relax, Purcell told him. We'll make a bandage. I've got some clean white socks in the glove compartment. Bullshit, hollered Bubba. You turn this damn bus around right now. We're going to see the sheriff. I mean it. Turn around. That goddamn monkey's going to get a bullet in his head probably got rabies and I don't know what all. Come on now, buddy. I mean it. Turn around and head this zoo on wheels to the sheriff's office, hauling wild animals around without no cage. You probably connected with that freak show yourself. It's going to be hell to pay for this. He was livid. Purcell pulled the bus into a small private road as if to turn around. Instead, he killed the engine, got out, opened the back door, and pulled Bubba out by his collar. He cold cocked him with one swishing Joe Palooka uppercut. Frank and Andy jumped him. 
one of them momentarily blinding him with a thudding blow to the temple. But using a combination of judo, jujitsu, karate, kung fu, and aikido, Purcell gradually chopped them into gory unconsciousness. He felt a wee dizzy himself. He lay down on his back in that ditch, sucked the remainder of the cigarettes into his head, giggled at the moon, and sunk into an honest sleep, dreamless but sweet as clover. So the Sacramento celebration of the Indo-Tibetan Circus and Giant Panda Gypsy Blues Band transpired without interference. For one participant, however, the aftermath of the revelry was not the least benign. The ringmaster was afflicted with a hangover of near terminal vileness. While the troopers prepared their belongings and equipment for the caravan to Eugene, Oregon, where they had three performances scheduled, nearly normal spent the morning vomiting self-portraits and farting Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies. Now in the curious medical treatise of Marcellus, who hung out his shingle in Bordeaux in the fourth century AD, there is a treatment for post-intoxicant malady that prescribes certain white stones found in the stomach of young swallows. Amanda just happened to have some such stones in her centaur carved lemonwood herb cabinet. All dried plant material in the cabinet had been confiscated by the Sacramento police. So she led nearly normal to a grassy spot by the river where he lay with the stones on its forehead and midsection. First, however, he ingested three aspirins, which were not unlike the stones in color and size. Medicine changed very little, smokestack lightning was heard to observe. About 10 o'clock, the September sun was just starting to tickle the bare backs of the roustabouts. Plucky Purcell chugged into camp whistling, try a little tenderness, through a muffler of dried blood and whiskey phlegm. Ran into some old Navy buddies, bit of boyish horseplay, he explained to Ziller. John Paul and the baboon had a restrained but joyous reunion. Amanda, said Zeller, permit me to present Plucky Purcell, grand transcendent eagle of crime, and Mon Cole of the genus Papio, my trusted friend and brother, through all weathers, frictions, and sublimes. Whereupon the baboon bowed deeply, catching a ray of sunlight upon his scarlet buttocks. Amanda and I were married yesterday, the gooby fashion, son officiating and this is thor aged two and one half who has graciously allowed me to be his papa purcell shook the boy's hand then kissed amanda's cheek in the manner of leonard bernstein executing a baggy shuffle all the while so as to conceal the erection the bride had immediately inspired zeller explained to amanda that california had recently enacted a law requiring motorcyclists passengers as well as operators to wear helmets. A policeman had pulled Ziller over in Golden Gate Park and insisted that if Von Cull were going to ride on a cycle like a human, he damn well better wear a helmet too. Naturally, the baboon refused to submit to that indignity. Although John Paul was aware that state patrolmen were generally a more intelligent breed than their municipal counterparts, he nevertheless did not wish to chance penalty and or delay while biking up to Sacramento. Hence, he had requested that old friend Plucky give Munkull a lift. Now, isn't that the shits, exclaimed Nuclear Phyllis, who, being a two-wheeler herself, had been drawn into the conversation. It's bad enough a person's head isn't his own anymore. The cops want to control what goes in and what goes on it. But now they want to tell animals what to wear. I mean, seriously, does the helmet law protect the public health, safety, or welfare? Hell no. It's designed to protect the bike rider from himself. A person's got a right to break his own head if he wants to. It's his head. It's his decision. It's not the point, baby, said Purcell, appraising the girl with greasy butcher's eye, apportioning her into loin chops and rump roasts, and nippled fillets. Granite, the helmet law is unconstitutional. Like a good fourth of the new 
laws today, but safety, health, and welfare were never a consideration. Pigs wouldn't care if every biker in the nation split his melon. Uh-huh. Duly constituted authority would sigh with relief. Think for a minute. What motivates a man to act? Bread, right? Like everything else, it's really a question of economics. The majority of motorcycle accidents are caused by automobile drivers. They aren't conditioned to looking out for bikes. So they're always slamming into them. Cat gets knocked off his scooter, cracks his headbone. Who has to pay? The auto insurance companies, that's who. Now the insurance gangsters got one of the most powerful lobbies around. They say, shit, the man says, what color? So it's the insurance companies who push that helmet law through to save themselves some bread. Everything that happens in this society, sooner or later, boils down to a matter of a buck. Are you truly convinced that our culture is that monetary plucky? Amanda asked. Look, sweetie, got your own reality going, Purcell replied. But this isn't the reality of the United States of America. Ha uh ha. -huh. After the doctors and scientific experts testified in Congress that cigarettes cause or compound not only cancer but a number of other diseases and are responsible for hundreds of thousands of deaths annually, the senior senator of Kentucky stood up, just shaking with anger and moaned, you're trying to wreck our economy. And what did Henry Ford II say when the government began insisting on safety devices and cars? The American people don't want anything that's going to upset the economy. What's more, Ford was right. 50,000 a year dead on the highways, but don't rock the economy. Look, America is no more a democracy than Russia is a communist state. Governments of the U.S. and Russia are practically the same. There's only a difference of degree. We both have the same basic form of government, economic totalitarianism. In other words, the settlement to all questions, the solution to all issues are determined not by what will make people most healthy and happy in their bodies and their minds, but by economics, dollars or rubles, economy, uber alice. Let nothing interfere with economic growth, even though that growth is castrating truth, poisoning beauty, turning a continent into a shit heap, and driving an entire civilization insane. Don't spill the Coca-Cola, boys, and keep those monthly payments coming. Shit! That American Eagle needs a feather job, don't it? Grumbled Nuclear Phyllis, staring at her own helmet in disgust. Well now, honey, that old helmet law might not be so bad, said Purcell. I know this cat down near L.A. got stopped by the heat for wearing his helmet strapped to his knee. He told them, the law says you gotta wear a helmet. It doesn't say where you gotta wear it. Well, the cops wrote him a ticket anyway and made him put the helmet on his head. So what happens? Five months down the road, he flipped the bike and broke his kneecap. Evidently, either the aspirin or the birdstones had worked a cure for nearly normal, walked up and enjoined the rapping troopers to return to their labors. Purcell climbed back in his bus. He had to get on the Aberdeen. He was already a day late and the logging foreman cracked an even smarter whip than nearly normal. He promised to catch up with the show in Washington, however, and spend a weekend or two with the troopers. Alas, that never came to pass, for within a month, plucky Purcell was to unwittingly instigate the chain of events which was to put Amanda and John Paul Zeller into their present jeopardy, which was to threaten the well-being of millions, which was to lead to the drafting of this very report. In the manner that is common among newlyweds, Amanda and John exchange many confidences during the early days of their marriage. The magician showed his bride how one could alter reality by rubbing mercury on one's feet or by stifling uranium. The bride, her tattoos resplendent as never before, showed the magician 
how one could chew wintergreen lifesavers in a dark room and make sparks with one's teeth. Peppermint won't work. Al Westminster Plucky Purcell is the youngest son of an old Virginia family, a once aristocratic clan which, instead of floundering in the Faulknerian funk when it ran out of money, simply blended with good-natured resignation into the lower middle class, unlike the desperate daughters of those unfortunate Virginia families that have sold their pottage for a mess of birthright, Plucky's sister made no attempt to marry the clan back into wealth and society, but settled himself instead for a barber and a civil engineer whom, presumably, they loved. Plucky's brother, rather than scrambling to rescue a bit of family prestige by entering the medical or legal professions or, preferably, the Episcopalian clergy, played and later coached pro football. In fact, the elder Purcell son was a three-time All-American halfback at Duke University. Plucky received an athletic scholarship to the same institution for scouts who'd seen him in action at Culpeper High, where were of the opinion that he would develop into a harder runner, if not a more accurate passer than his big brother. That is, scouts who'd seen Plucky in action on the gridiron. Had they seen him in action on the back roads of Culpeper County, they might have more accurately forecast his future. After a mediocre start, his sophomore year at Duke, Plucky blossomed toward the end of the season. In his last three games, he scored 10 touchdowns, four of them on carries of more than 50 yards. Sports writers from all corners predicted confidently that Plucky Purcell would run off with national scoring honors the following season. Who among them could have guessed that a week before the season opened, Plucky Purcell would run off to Mexico with a backfield coach's wife? It was decided that Mun Cole would travel in the nursery truck, although he was well past the age when his peers were said to grow cantankerous, and although he was a chakma, the largest of the baboon families, Mon Cole was considered a fit companion for the circus tots. My friend has shared private amusements with children on five continents, Ziller assured the parents. He was romped with heirs to a hundred fortunes and a dozen thrones. There will be no unpleasantries. In a canvas jumpsuit decorated with watercolor landscapes and embroidered Indonesian butterflies. Amanda mounted the BMW behind her husband, who was in loincloth and leather. She had been warned by nearly normal that the harsh bouncing of the motorcycle might jar the embryo loose from its moorage, but rather than be separated from Ziller, she elected to assume the risk. The day was an Indian summer showpiece. In the sunny calm, the canyon seemed a gallery of bronzes and jades. High overhead, a hawk traced a helix on unblemished newsprint blue. Frictional vitality burnished the guts of everyone in the caravan. It quickened when nearly normal, sounded the move out command on the Tibetan devil horn. The snow was back on the road. As Ziller was about to kick the BMW into action, little Pammy, the goat and yak girl, ran up to his side. Mr. Ziller, she cried. Mr. Ziller, I just wanted to tell you how much I dug the hoodoo meat bucket. Oh, it was super groovy. All my friends have your record album. Got it on the black market. My mother wouldn't allow it in the house. Said it was the sickest thing she'd ever heard, but I love it. So beautiful and funny. Why did you break up? I mean, just when you were getting accepted. What led you to take off to Africa? The sun gleamed on Ziller's opal-studded helmet. He stood erect over his motorcycle as though he were about to bend it to his will. To Pammy, he handed a page that had been ripped from some kind of journal. And as the BMW roared to the front of the motorcade, she read, The invitation to Tarzan's Bar Mitzvah, written in nut juice and wrapped in a leaf, arrived in my mailbox with an organic rustle, smelling of camel dung, but promising a feast. 
and invoking the immediate black jungle visions, the hair of the cannibal, and the sweet of the beast. A rather anxious football coach flew to Mexico in pursuit of his wife and her famous athlete lover. While the sporting world reeled from the delicious blow of the scandal, the lovers ate mangoes and found one another in the streets of Guadalajara. And that is where he, the husband, caught up with them in the plaza of the city. Official had taken his colt from him at the border, but he had purchased a cleaver from a native butcher and upon spotting the fugitive, sought to put uh, it to grim use. His wife was so weak from love and diarrhea she could neither fight nor flee. I'm like a cream puff with the cream squeezed out, she sighed and slumped on a bench to accept her fate. I'll take care of you later, said her husband, and he made a move for Plucky Purcell. Plucky, too, was experiencing a touch of Montezuma's revenge, but he nevertheless gave the greatest broken field running performance of his career. Now the coach, though a bit out of shape, was no lead-footed mover himself. And after 16 wild minutes, through the narrow streets of Guadalajara, he fell to his knees panting frantically and watched Purcell's stiff arm an orange juice vendor and disappear down an alley. That midnight, as he nervously checked out his hotel, Purcell paused to share a short tequila with the desk clerk. He gave the Mexican a true account of the day's adventure. You are pretty lucky, senor, the clerk confided. Not lucky, said Plucky. Plucky. As the careful reader might have supposed, Amanda has been a bit distraught as of late. In fact, so preoccupied has she been with the fate of her husband and the corpse that accompanied him in his flight that she just this hour noticed the writer's efforts at reportage. Although all afternoon his typewriter had been bobbing before him like a rubber duck in a tub. At her belatedly expressed curiosity, the writer disclosed that he was attempting to record the bizarre and momentous events in which they seemed so irredeemably entangled. He did not, of course, tell her that it was she who was the substance of his accounting. To reveal that would be to reveal the breadth of his esteem for her, which she would consider excessively misplaced in the light of the corpse, which, dead as it was, was the true and important protagonist in this drama. The extent of the author's regard for Amanda is a bag cat to which he cannot grant amnesty at this time. There are too many unknown quantities, not just the matter of the courts, which is scary enough, but personal considerations. What is to be Ziller's lot? What, for that matter, is to be the writer's lot? One does not sit at ease with one's future when one is trapped in a roadside zoo by agents of an unfriendly government, even when that government is one's own. At any rate, it was admitted to Amanda that the report was only in its preliminary stages. Otherwise, how can the writer explain his planned return to the keyboard in the morning? She inquired if might not the report one day be of interest to historians and such? Yes, replied the author. That's a possibility, providing that it is not suppressed. Silently, he added. But if it's history they want, I'll have to accept it on my terms, not without my sense of duty in this matter. But duty to whom is quite another business. It was then asked of Amanda if there was not some comment she might like to insert here at the onset of the account. No, it wouldn't interrupt continuity. No, not at all. In cut-off jeans that hung below her belly and a gypsy cape that barely concealed her breast, she was paler than the writer had ever seen her. A moistly gleaming ivory, like the neck of a clam. Well, she said brightly, do you notice anything odd about these crackers? She held them out in the woven Hada basket from which she was snacking. No, they look like ordinary sesame crackers to me. If you were more perceptive, she said, you would have noticed that they have seeds on only one side. That's true. Why do sesame crackers have seeds on both sides? They do at the equator, she said, but in the southern hemisphere, all the seeds are on the other side. 
sailing. Lighter than air kiss at the author, Amanda vanished into her meditation room to try once more to induce a husband locating trance. How do you suppose the seeds are distributed at the poles, she called through the perfume curtain. And the writer heard no more, except a gentle fanning, like the passage of a moth. <laughs>